Ever get that feeling, you know, like your phone's kind of listening to your thoughts? Like it knows you're craving tacos before you even do. Uh-huh, yeah. Well, today's deep dive, it takes that whole is my phone listening paranoia to a whole new level. We're talking brain data today. And a new California law that's sending, well, ripples through the tech world. Yeah, it's a big one. Now, California isn't exactly new to this whole data privacy thing, right? Right. They're actually the second state to pass a law specifically protecting our brainwaves. Yeah, it's interesting to see them kind of leading the charge again. And it's not as futuristic as it sounds, because we're not just talking like theoretical sci-fi scenarios here. No. This law is about consumer devices that are already out there. Yeah. You know, those brain-sensing headsets people use for meditation or focus. Exactly, yeah. Everyday tech. Yeah. Those. So what exactly is brain data, and why should we care if it's protected? Well, I think that's the big question, right? Yeah. It's. I mean, the law basically says it's the information, the raw data collected by these brain computer interfaces. So things like your neural activity, which is, you know, as unique to you as a fingerprint. It's like a neural fingerprint, essentially. It's, it is. And, you know, the law says companies can't just go around buying and selling your brain data like they do with your browsing history, which is, you know, scary to think about. That is a bit of a scary thought. Yeah. They have to make an effort to de-identify it and you get some say in what they collect which is, you know, step in the right direction for sure. It's a step, definitely. I don't know about you, but I find that absolutely mind-blowing. What's fascinating is this law recognizes how incredibly personal and revealing our brain data truly is. I mean, we're not just talking about what you're thinking at any given moment, but potentially, you know, your deeply held beliefs, your emotions, even things you might not be consciously aware of. Whoa. This isn't just like your shopping list. This is, you know, the blueprint of your inner world. Okay. I'm starting to see why this is a big deal. Mm. But you said California is the second state to pass a law like this. Mm. Does that mean this is just the tip of the iceberg? Are we going to see more of this? Exactly. And I mean, you know, California, it's like the Silicon Valley of... Well, everything tech, right? Pretty much, yeah. So, yeah, this law could set a precedent for how brain data is handled globally, especially with neurotechnology becoming more and more integrated into our daily lives. It's only a matter of time. So it sounds like this law is a good first step, but, like, there might be more to the story. Let's unpack this a little further, shall we? Yeah. So this law, yeah, it sounds like a step in the right direction, but I have a feeling it's not, you know... A slam dunk. Yeah. What's the catch? What are we missing here? You're right to be skeptical. The law mostly focuses on protecting neural data, you know, the raw electrical signals, the stuff from your brain. But um, there's this whole gray area surrounding. It's called non-neural information. And this is where things get really interesting. So even if the raw data, the stuff from your brain waves, even if that's protected, the inferences drawn from that data, especially like when combined with other information, that might not be. Okay, hold on. Non-neural information inference, you got to break this down for me a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, so imagine this. Your smartwatch, it tracks your heart rate, right? And it notices the spike every time, you know, you get a notification. But it's from a specific person. Okay. Yeah. Now, let's say an algorithm analyzes that data, not your brain waves, but your heart rate. And it can potentially, you know, like infer a lot about your relationship with that person. Wow. Maybe even the content of those messages, all without directly accessing your brain data, just using that other information. Wait, so my Apple Watch could be like spilling the tea on my inner thoughts based on my heart rate. Yeah. That's both hilarious and slightly terrifying. Exactly. And it's not just your heart rate, right? We're talking like pupil dilation, you know, facial expressions, even like your skin's electrical conductivity. All of these things can subtly change based on your thoughts and emotions. Oh. And AI is getting really good at picking up on those subtle cues. This is where the concept of cognitive biometrics comes in. Basically, it refers to those unique patterns in our biological data that can be used to infer our, you know, mental and emotional states. Okay, I see where you're going with this. So even if the law protects the raw data, the stuff from our brains, all this other stuff, our cognitive biometrics, that could still be up for grabs. Yeah, and that's the concern. Experts like Marcello Yenka and Nita Farahani, they're raising that. They argue the definition of brain data, it needs to be broader to encompass these, you know, indirect inferences. Otherwise, companies could just exploit these loopholes and potentially learn more about us than we're comfortable with. That's a bit unsettling. It makes you realize how much we unknowingly reveal through our, like, biometrics, even without realizing it. Like, our bodies are whispering secrets our minds don't even know about. 
It's true. And, and it gets even more, I don't know, complex when you factor in how this data can be analyzed, which is where AI enters the picture. This is where it gets really wild, As right? AI analyzing our brain waves and telling us things even we didn't know about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Let's dive into that. This is where it gets really wild, right? AI analyzing our brain waves and telling us things even we didn't know about ourselves. Let's dive into that. It really is mind blowing when you think about it. Artificial intelligence could be like the key to unlocking these incredible breakthroughs, you know, yeah. in neuroscience, medicine, all that. Yeah. Imagine like algorithms sifting through, I don't know, mountains of brain scans, identifying patterns, maybe indicating like early stage Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, even depression. Oh yeah things that might be missed by the human eye. We're talking about a, you know, a fighting chance to intervene earlier and, and potentially change the trajectory of these diseases. That's incredible. Early diagnosis and treatment could be I mean, right. revolutionary for so many people. Absolutely. And it, it goes beyond just, you know, disease. AI could like revolutionize brain computer interfaces, you know, allowing people with disabilities to like control prosthetics or even communicate their thoughts directly just by thinking. Uh, it's like something straight out of science fiction, but you know, it's becoming a reality. Okay. Now that is what I call a game changer, but let's be real. You know, there are always two sides to every coin. What about the potential downsides of AI, you know, getting all up in our brain data. You're hitting the nail on the head. The same AI that could like help us decode and treat brain disorders could also be used to, I don't know, interpret our thoughts and emotions with like unprecedented accuracy. Imagine a world where like advertisers can tailor messages based on like your subconscious desires or where employers can monitor your focus and engagement in real time. It's both like exhilarating and a little terrifying, isn't it? Exhilarating and terrifying is a pretty good way to sum it up. So where does this leave us? What are we supposed to do with all this information, all these what ifs? That's the million dollar question, right? As neurotechnology and AI become, you know, more sophisticated, we need to ask ourselves some, I don't know, tough questions. What aspects of our brain data, if any, are we comfortable sharing? How do we balance the incredible potential of these technologies with the like fundamental need to protect our, you know, our mental privacy? It's a conversation we all need to be a part of. This has been quite the deep dive for our listeners who are now both incredibly excited and slightly terrified about the future of their brain data. And let's be honest, it's probably all of us. What can we do? How do we stay informed and maybe even influence how this technology develops? It starts with awareness, right? The more you know about neurotechnology, AI, and the, you know, the ethical questions they raise, the more empowered you are to make informed decisions about, you know, your own data and advocate for, you know, responsible innovation. Just keep learning, stay curious, and don't be afraid to, you know, demand better from the companies developing these technologies. Knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it might be the key to protecting the privacy of our own minds. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into the world of brain data, AI, and the future of our minds. Until next time, try not to let those targeted ads freak you out too much.